Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. With Arun Goyal's surprise resignation as election commissioner, the election commission has been reduced to a one-man commission. With just weeks to go before the next national elections, is this a matter of concern? And secondly, if two new election commissioners are appointed under the new laws, which allow the government a majority and can override any differences of opinion with the opposition, again, with weeks to go for the next general election, would that be a second matter of concern? Those are the two key issues I should take up today. And my first guest is former Chief Election Commissioner S.Y. Qureshi. Mr. Qureshi, with Arun Goel's surprise resignation and the retirement last month of Anoop Chandra Pandey, the Election Commission has become a one-man commission just weeks before the elections are held. If it stays that way, there will be only one person to take decisions, only one person to adjudicate complaints, and only one person to rule about alleged breaches of the model code of conduct. As a former Chief Election Commissioner, would that be a matter of concern? Well, not at all. Not at all, because... So remember till 1991, there used to be a one-man commission, the CEC. And also this, uh, the current CEC, Rajiv, I know personally, in the sense, uh, ever since he has been the, the, in the election commission, he is extremely competent. He has his hands on uh, the entire uh, process. He is in uh, command, in control, and he can uh, do it very effortlessly. And I have always said for the last 10, 12 years, even when I was on chair, that um, uh, election commission is already on autopilot. He, they, uh, the uh, three election commissioners sit uh, relaxed in the room when the elections are happening, only waiting for a model code uh, complaint in which we sit in judgment. Otherwise, the management of the election is uh, conducted, is done by 12 million government servants. Effortlessly, the brightest of IAS officers, the IPS officers, they're all doing it. Uh, it is on autopilot. So, so no, then, no problem, no worry. So are you saying that in principle you have no problem with a one-man election commission? Or are you also saying if that one man is Mr. Rajiv Kumar, then in that specific instance you would have no problem? So is it the principle of a one-man commission? Or is it the fact that that one man is Mr. Rajiv Kumar? Which of the two? No, no, no. no. I'm glad that you pointed out the distinction. Actually, both of them. Even uh, one man in principle uh, can handle it because if, if he knows the thing, he has been around for two, three years. He knows the, the process inside out. You, We have been following in the media. They have been going to all the states, uh, which is extremely important. Uh, the meeting with the political parties, all the stakeholders, all that the, the laid down the standard procedure has been happening. So he's in command. And the second thing, the knowing Rajiv, uh, the, very, very competent man and a very conscientious man also, let, uh, let me tell you, as far as uh, my reading uh, goes, he will be able to handle it perfectly. However, I don't rule out the uh, two other uh, commissioners being appointed within the next one week. I'll come to that in a moment's time. But you're saying to me as a former chief election commissioner that you have no problem in principle with a one-man election commission. Therefore, I take it it follows 
you are your is your preference a three man commission or you have no preferences between the two no 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 ideally it's a three. i have said in my book that the, the the best thing which has happened to election commission in 70 years is a multi member commission because however wise and brilliant i may think i am there are other two to moderate me all the time which is a good thing and a collective decision three heads are better than one when the decision comes from the closed room of the election commission when the, all the, you know we have a lot of democracy we used to have the differences in our time but we had taken a decision that for half an hour before we call in the officers we meet in uh, separately just the three of us our differences were sorted out amongst ourselves so that nobody knows that we are a divided house but and what came out of that room was a unanimous decision Absolutely. and it was very smooth so so if so i that, if i understand you correctly mr kureshi your preference is a multi member commission i e a three man commission but in principle you have no problem with a one man commission either and in particular you have no qualms and reservations and doubts about mr rajiv kumar because you believe if he was the one man commission he is adequately competent and talented to handle the job absolutely you summed it up very well for me secondly would you be apprehensive or concerned if two new election commissioners are appointed again just weeks before the national election is due to be held under the new law which gives the government a majority that can override any dissent or any difference with the opposition would you have apprehensions if two new election commissioners are appointed under this new law where the government has a determining majority yeah you know that is a very core question which you have raised which i have been pointing at also that the other two uh, now in principle the three is the, is the best no doubt but the the other two are not given a constitutional protection from removal and i have used the word that they feel they are on probation now the people on probation feel most insecure they will be looking over their shoulders whether the government is happy with me or not will i be elevated to cec or not in which case suppose the say, cec becomes difficult the other two can outvote him because we go by majority vote so they can outvote him 10 times a day so in principle that is a possibility that threat uh, exists but one can only hope that the, the two who come in i take be... your point i take your point but your point is essentially to do with the insecurity of the other two i'm actually questioning you about the way the other two are chosen would you be worried if just weeks before the next national election these remaining two election commissioners are chosen by a law which gives the government a majority where it can overrule whatever the opposition feels would that method of selection worry you because it would allow the prime minister to push through his people no no actually this this, this uh, objection is totally misinformed now they they are saying that the government is all powerful they have the majority well this this for 70 years the government was all powerful because pm alone was deciding and uh, about 20 25 uh, cecs have been appointed by the one man the prime minister in this case at least there is a token leader of opposition which is surely tokenism it is uh, optically very bad thing in the law that they have uh, formed a collegium with a prime minister and a uh, cabinet minister versus the leader of opposition optically it is uh, horrible so uh, but uh, so be it so you have no qualms about the present law where the government has two votes and the opposition only one and you don't share the concern that this process could lead to the prime minister's chosen favorite people who may not be the best people for the job getting appointed you don't share that concern no 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 let me tell you i have a qualm my qualm is that the, this uh, uh, collegium which has been formed is uh, a, 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 is a charade it is it is bogus because the two to one is we know it already the leader of opposition is uh, that nobody already therefore i have a qualm but what i am saying is that this collegium uh, ultimately amounts to prime minister deciding but which was the case for the last 70 years also so uh, how does it matter so uh, prime minister has been deciding let the prime minister decide tell me something would you personally have preferred the system laid out by the supreme court which was then overtaken and overruled by the government where three people would have decided together the prime minister the chief justice of india and the leader of the opposition would that have been a preferable system 
Absolutely, because that is the uh, collision which is working for CVC, for CIC, for director of CBI, except for one, uh, one case. No appointment by the collegium has been questioned in the last 10 years. So, and in any case, with chief justice being there and leader of opposition, it becomes a, a non-partisan uh, the collegium, and which was the spirit of the order of the Supreme Court. When the PIL went to Supreme Court, which was decided three months ago, all this they said that this appointment has to be bipartisan. Now, this uh, current collegium is surely not bipartisan. It is 100% partisan. So, about what joke has been played uh, on the nation, I don't understand. And what purpose does it serve? If, if I was the Prime Minister, uh, one good thing which has happened in the law, that uh, there is now a shortlisting committee uh, uh, headed by the law. Oh, just a moment. The recommendations of the shortlisting committee do not constitute the totality of people who are considered. The government has the right to choose people outside the recommendation of the selection committee. So absolutely. the committee's recommendations don't mean anything. Yes, absolutely. Now that is the first, the first ridiculous thing that the selection the shortlisting committee works hard and looks at 200 a dossier and from there they, they select five and the government says, you know, no, we don't like this. We bring in the six. That is ridiculous, absurd, objectionable and it should be, come, uh, I think, uh, annulled by the, the Supreme Court. The, the, but, yeah. I know, but carry on, finish your sentence, but. Yeah. Now, the, 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 that is about the, the bringing in the sixth man from outside, that's one. But within the collegium, uh, but, uh, the, my point is that the uh, law minister, when he selects five officers, surely he would get them cleared from the prime minister beforehand. Now, if all five are uh, cleared by the prime minister, they, if they, all five are my men and you are the leader of opposition, I will say, uh, tell you, uh, Karan, you as a leader of opposition, pick up anybody because they are all my men anyway. You pick up anybody, you will feel happy that you... Yes, but that's officer. not the process. The process is actually the Prime Minister and a Minister of the Government appointed and chosen by the Prime Minister have a majority and the two yes. can decide who the person will be and if the Leader of the Opposition differs, the Leader of the Opposition is a minority of one and his view doesn't count. That's why the present collegium system is weighted heavily in favour of the Government rather than being impartial and balanced. Absolutely, that's what I've been saying. That this, in which case, uh, let me ask you this. There are many people who are today apprehensive. There are many people today who have doubts that either if the election commission remains a one-man commission or if two new commissioners are appointed by a procedure where the government has the majority say, there could be questions and doubts raised about either the conduct of the forthcoming elections or even possibly the fairness of those elections. Do you share those concerns and apprehensions? Well, uh, you know, the, as I have been saying, that three-member commission is, uh, in principle, is a very good idea, which is the best thing which has happened. But the procedure which has now been laid down, in the original draft uh, uh, bill uh, three months ago, it was correct. Uh, the, uh, everything about collegium uh, was correct, but later on they changed it. And uh, this is now uh, ridiculous. The collegium uh, PM and his... Uh, so, so, do you have concerns about the forthcoming election? That's what I'm talking about. Are you worried that the present process could lead to questions and doubts about something about which we should have no questions and doubts whatsoever? Well, you know, uh, I can say that uh, with confidence after I see the appointment of the next two commissioners. If uh, they are the uh, people of reputation and if reputation, everybody in... Uh, the reputation travels, uh, if they are people of a uh, good record and good reputation, then there is no problem. Otherwise, uh, one man, uh, a, a trusted, a reliable person that current CEC is. Yes, but you are saying to me that it all depends upon the quality of the people and the integrity of the people that the Prime Minister and that Collegium appoint. If yes. those two new appointees are yes men, which some people fear may be the case, then you would have serious concerns about the integrity of the forthcoming elections. Have I understood that correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Theoretically, yes. But uh, in any case, uh, now the latest provision is earlier there was no qualification. At least the qualification has been prescribed by the Act. There will all be secretary rank officers. And to become a secretary to government, you uh, surely are a, a bright officer with a good track record. So chances are that there will be good Sir, people. Let me point out something. 
A lot of people who become secretaries of the government are also believed to be, I'm not saying it's a fact, but believed to be yesmen of the government. And that is the danger if they get appointed to be election commissioners. Are you therefore sanguine that the best people will be chosen? Or do you have doubts and concerns? Answer that specifically. No, I think uh, the, I'm sanguine that the best people will be chosen. And uh, because the, they will also know that they're uh, under watch, the nation is watching. And I'm sure the, they will conduct themselves well. Give me. Uh, because that from Kabir, not, Kabir, that, that has not, let me put it like this. Yeah. In the last four years, two election commissioners have abruptly resigned well before their term was over. Both of them were due to go on to become chief election commissioner. Both of them, by resigning, have forsaken that promotion. The first was Ashok Lavasa. He resigned over differences that were alleged in the newspapers to exist over handling of model of conduct complaints. And now we have Mr. Goel, the Hindustan Times is speculating that he's resigned because of differences with the chief election commissioner. We know it's only speculation, but does it worry you that in four years, two election commissioners have resigned, perhaps because of differences internally and an inability to get on with their colleagues? Well, it is true that the two have resigned prematurely, but the circumstances were different in both cases. Ashok Lavasa was hounded out for obvious for the reason known to everybody. In this case, it has come as a surprise. We don't know what expects. Of course, there were murmurs, there were rumors that uh, the CEC and he are not getting along. So, and But it could not have been so serious that uh, he was forced uh, by circumstances or forced by somebody. But we don't resign. know. We don't know whether it was that serious or not. You're simply assuming it wasn't. We don't know. You know, quite right. But for, for a man who would have been CEC and would have been there till 2027, to resign abruptly, there has to be something serious behind are it. You, are you worried that increasingly the election commission is being perceived to be a an institution where yesmen of the prime minister are being put in, and b it's being perceived to be as insufficiently independent of the government in its functioning and in its decisions? Does that worry you? Absolutely. It worries me a lot. And the election commission is not the only institution. There are other uh, institutions of the constitution which, uh, which are in similar state. But stick to the election commission. Explain to me your fears. Why are you worried? You know, the fact that uh, uh, every the election commission appointment uh, is working, it's uh, uh, coming into public criticism, public gaze. It never happened before. Uh, uh, elections were conducted smoothly, even if we were appointees of the government of the day. In fact, you may recall, remember, Karan, when I was the CEC and you asked me uh, whether I would have preferred to uh, have been appointed by a collegium, I said absolutely, because the appointment by collegium would have meant that I'm uh, acceptable across the board, across all political parties. And the, uh, as per your style, you uh, insisted. Uh, that, I, that I should name okay, whether if the leader of opposition Sushma Zorai had approved you would you have felt better I said definitely because public perception is all that is important. You know you spoke a moment ago about your deep concern that the election commission is coming into public criticism. Why is that happening? There are three well, possible reasons. Let me put the three reasons you tell me which you think is the right one. A, because of the way it is functioning and the decisions it's taking, which are controversial. B, because of the nature and character of people appointed to the election commission. C, because the election commission, even in its functioning, has failed to establish an arm's length distance from the government. Which of the three? I think the third. I think the third, uh, that is uh, the most important thing. And also, to, I will add to that, the lack of communication. Now, the election commission not meeting political parties is not acceptable for any reason. Now, political parties are the biggest stakeholders. They want to come and uh, the door should be open 24 by 7. And not meeting them is unpardonable and uh, whosoever is the incumbent. So you have serious concerns about the way the election commission over the last decade has been functioning because that's what you're saying. Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. And I've written about it and I've spoken about it. 
So in other words, the election commission must be both more transparent and more communicative, but at the same time, it must ensure that an arm's length distance from the government is maintained so that no one ever believes it is subservient to the government. Absolutely. The last one particularly is a constitutional mandate. The other two is a, is a matter of a style of management and functioning. The last is absolutely mandatory. So you also accept that in the last 10 years, the image of the Election Commission, an institution that is critical to the integrity of our democracy, in the last 10 years, that image of the Election Commission has suffered and been damaged. Has damaged, has been damaged uh, a lot. In fact, I have some uh, slide from 2009 election. After the election, the headline from the national paper, well done, EC. Congratulations, EC. It is easy with the victor. Then I have headlines after 2019 election, 34 headlines I have collected, disgrace on election, uh, in, uh, partial election, partisan election commission, all these things now, uh, what does it reflect? That things, the things have changed, something has gone wrong. And yet, despite the fact, as you say, a lot of damage has been suffered by the image and credibility of the election commission, you have no serious qualms about the fact that the government will dominate the appointment process and can push through its own people, and you have no serious qualms about the possibility that we may face a ele national election with a one-man commission. Both of those you have no serious qualms about, but you are worried about the damage done, and you said it's a lot of damage to the image and credibility of the commission. Yes, correct. Because, you know, I'm not so worried about the whether PM alone appoints because he has been doing it for 70 years. I was a beneficiary of the system or a collegium, which is a notional, nominal commission, uh, token commission, to a collegium, which, of course, uh, to my mind, is uh, absolutely is, uh, undesirable. It could have been the same collegium, which is operating in the country. Yes. Okay. I thank you very much for making time for Mr. Qureshi. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you very much. I'm now joined by former Chief Election Commissioner T.S. Krishnamurti. Mr. Krishnamurti was Chief Election Commissioner during the national elections of 2004. Mr. Krishnamurti, with Arun Goel's surprise resignation and the retirement last month of Anoop Chandra Pandey, the Election Commission has become a one-man commission just weeks before the next round of national elections are due to be held. If it stays that way, there will be one person to take decisions, one person to adjudicate complaints, one person to rule about alleged breaches of the model code of conduct. Is that a matter of concern? Well, you know, about and about 30 to 35 years back, it was only a single member election commission. The law was changed in order to improve the credibility of the institution. So theoretically, a single chief election commissioner can conduct the election. But in order to improve the credibility of the process, I think the law was amended and two more election commissioners were appointed statutorily. So I would say if there are three members, it is certainly much better than single person. In other words, the credibility of the election commission will be enhanced if there are three members as opposed to just one. Now, I would put it this way, you know, there, there is a visible impact. The political parties would prefer it that way because the three-member commission gives an opportunity for a variety of opinions to be discussed before decisions are taken by the election commission. The political parties will have more faith in a three-member commission, and that's how it has been upheld even by the Supreme Court. Judging by your own personal opinion, would you prefer a three-member commission? Well, I will always say a three-member commission is certainly better than a single member because you have to provide for angularities of single person in conducting the election. So it is better to have three persons so that the chance of a single man deciding the issue will be avoided. Secondly, Mr. Krishnamurti, would you be apprehensive or would you be concerned if two new election commissioners are appointed again, just weeks before elections are held, under the new law, which gives the government a majority that can, if need be, override or overlook any difference of opinion from the opposition? Well, as far as the law that has been just enacted, I would not comment on it because it is supposed to be pending in the court. 
the constitutionality of the law. Well, as far as a three-member commission is concerned, I agree. It is much better than one person deciding. And how they are being appointed, well, there, can, there are differences of opinion in, in, uh, in the country. But um, I would rather await the decision of the Supreme Court in this regard. Let me put this to you. Would you personally have preferred the system for appointing election commissioners that was set out by the Supreme Court, where the government had only one vote, and that was the vote of the Prime Minister, but the other two votes were with the Chief Justice of India and the leader of the opposition. Would you have preferred that system? Well, as far as I am concerned, uh, a view was already expressed by me that we may have to follow the system that is practiced for CBI director or the CVC uh, appointment. So that has been the precedence is there. So I'm sure the practice of three members, including a nominee of the Chief Justice, had a better credibility, no doubt about that. So a three-member panel, including a nominee of the Chief Justice, would have greater credibility. That's right. In either case, whether we have a one-man commission presiding over the forthcoming elections or two new commissioners appointed by a procedure that gives the government a determining majority, have questions arisen about the conduct and perhaps even the fairness of the elections that will happen in a couple of weeks' time? Well, it's very difficult to prejudge the two persons who are going to be appointed. Already, the, there are news reports that they are going to be decided by 14th or 15th of March, whatever it be. I will presume, my presumption is, the right persons will be appointed and the election process will go on as has always been with a certain amount of credibility. So, people who raise questions about the future election in terms of the way they are conducted or in possible terms to do with their fairness, those doubts, those apprehensions you believe at this moment of time are unfounded? Well, I will. I, my view is that the right decision and right appointments will be made. If that be so, why should I be pessimistic or why should I think that the election may not be fair and free? The presumption is the right people will be there. Now, one thing is absolutely true, Mr. Krishnamurti. It's no secret that in the last 10 years, and perhaps I should say particularly since 2019, public apprehensions and doubts have been raised both about appointments to the Election Commission, but also about decisions made by the Election Commission. Does the present situation add to those concerns? Uh, I, I don't think I'm in a position to straight away say yes or no, because there are always differences of opinion. Political parties have different perceptions, and I presume that will continue to be there. But whether uh, the, it, it is similar to what it has been so far, it's very difficult for me to comment on that. We don't know officially why Mr. Goyles resigned, but there is speculation in papers like the Hindustan Times in particular, but also in other papers, that differences had emerged between him and the Chief Election Commissioner, Mr. Rajiv Kumar. Again, we only have speculation. But this is the second time in the last four years that differences between other election commissioners and one election commissioner has led to the resignation of an election commissioner, the last person being Ashok Lavasa. Does it worry you as someone who's been chief election commissioner that these differences yes. A, occur and B, be written about and talked about? No, it does worry me in the same. When I was also there in the election commission, we used to have difference of opinion, but we used to sort them out. The mechanism the institution provides a majority view to prevail. After all, in any collective institution, you cannot have a single unanimous view. So there should be difference of opinion. These differences of opinion should be ironed out. I do not know why uh, two election commissioners had earlier resigned. They have their own reasons. I'm sure they have uh, justifiable reasons. But be that me so, I do not approve of a person uh, straight away resigning because you should give an opportunity in any case, as far as the present situation is concerned, one more person was to be appointed. He could have waited because as of now, when two persons are uh, discussing issues, the law clearly says the majority view will prevail. So if you have a difference of opinion, the other person's view cannot prevail. So I don't know why he, uh, he took a decision, but 
be that as it may, difference of opinion are bound to be there, but they have to be ironed out. A, a, a acceptable solution has to be found. That's where uh, senior um, uh, officials are expected to be. I don't know why this should happen rather frequently now. If I hear you correctly, you have certain concerns about the fact that Mr. Goel has chosen to resign at this point of time, A, when it was already a two-person commission, and B, just before elections are about to be announced. You feel he could have waited and considered his resignation more carefully? No, I, I don't think I can comment on that. It is his decision. He must have his own reasons. But the point is, difference of opinion is a healthy sign. It should continue. And then an attempt should be made to have an anonymous decision acceptable to all the three. That is the purpose of having a three-member commission. The differences are bound to be there. And whether his resignation is timely or not, I wish not. I would not like to comment without knowing the reason. So I presume uh, he has applied his mind and taken a decision. But it has put the election commission's um, performance into some kind of a difficulty. They have to now get the two more persons. Then. Uh, uh, address themselves to the issue of schedule, etc. So, my my impression or my view is that as far as possible, resignation on account of difference of opinion could be avoided or could be better planned in terms of time. So, when you say resignation over differences of opinion should either be avoided or better planned with reference to time, what you're saying to election commissioners is, Think carefully before you resign. Differences of opinion are healthy. Don't let them become a breaking point. Yeah, in a way, yes, I, I would say I have always welcomed the difference of opinion. We have always, all the three of us, we have sat together, we have ironed out our differences and we took the decisions. So it's a, it's, I think it's inbuilt in the system. There should be difference of opinion and we should take a decision accordingly because it's a question of the issue of national pre and fair elections. So there must be an opportunity for difference of opinions to prevail. Finally, Mr. Krishnamurti, how critical is the Election Commission to the integrity of India's democracy? And connected with that, how much damage is done to the Election Commission when it's perceived to not be sufficiently independent of the government? How damaging is that perception? <laughs> it's, it's indeed a very difficult question for me to answer. You see, the election commission has to prove its credibility only by its performance. I think all along it has been reasonably doing well. And people have perceptions. The political parties have different perceptions and so on. But whether the perceptions are right or wrong, I don't think I'm the right person to comment about it. But the issue is the election commission should not hesitate to correct any, any impression of being you know, not free and fair. It should not hesitate to correct any impression that it is not free and fair. That's right. That sadly is an impression that seems to have spread through the country during the last decade. You're saying, therefore, that is something they must correct. No, your view certainly you know, it can be a different one. All that I'm saying is if there are any apprehensions or if there are any views that are different, we have to clarify why we have taken such a decision, why we are doing, the, uh, we are taking decisions in such a particular manner. It is the duty of the election commission to clarify these things so that people and the parties have certain amount of credibility in the institution. You're putting a lot of emphasis on the need to clarify. Are you saying that transparency is essential to the functioning of the commission and to the credibility of the commission? Transparency is an important ingredient of any democratic institution. I have no doubts on that. So transparency, therefore, is also critical to the functioning of the election commission. It is, it is always an important ingredient. There is no doubt about it. And we have always been, uh, I mean, as far as uh, it performance until uh, I was there, we have had no problem. We have always been able to clarify our situation. And I am sure that in the years to come, and the election commission to take adequate steps to clarify why and how certain decisions are taken. Mr. Krishnamurti, thank you very much for making time to talk to me. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. 
During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.